Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Hamburg, and good morning, remote participant. Yes, uh, I'm Thomas, uh, co-founder and CTO from Flex Optics. Uh, I'm in these days mainly involved in the technology part of uh, in Flex Optics, doing currently uh, testing and uh, establishing links on 400 gigabit uh, with customers. And uh, I brought you a topic today, uh, especially the, uh, the title is the complexity of hyperspeed transceivers. And I want to look into the transceiver itself to give you a little bit of better idea and understanding what really happens inside there. And um, you, you might, you can compare it a little bit with when I started networking, 100 megabit was somehow commodity, and one gigabit was somehow the bleeding edge. And then these days, also Google started to offer their services. They used at these days a broker for a thousand switch to connect their compute nodes with each other. Now, roughly 20 years later, um, actually 10 gigabit is commodity, and 100 gigabit becomes commodity, and 400 gigabit is somehow the bleeding edge. When you also compare the network you have built 20 years ago with the network today, even inside the network itself on the logical le uh, level as well, or layer, uh, the complexity got up, up pretty much. Uh, the same happened to transceivers, and um, that's what I want to talk now. So first of all, here's a comparison, uh, what you see there of a 10 gigabit SFP plus on the, on the, on the up there. And then below, uh, I opened up a 400 gigabit uh, QSF PDD for you. And uh, the components I want to show today is especially the transmitter and receiver part, the golden boxes actually, and that's also where the artificial word transceiver comes from. When you combine transmit and receive, you get transceiver. And then there is a new component in there. We got this fancy. Here we go. Uh, which is quite new, in, uh, introduced to pluggable modules, to pluggable transceivers. It's a digital signal processor, the DSP, who is mainly in charge of two functions. The first one is to uh, take care about the modulation. You have might heard about in our set and PAM4, uh, but that's not the content of the talk today. Um, and the second function is the forward error correction, and that's uh, actually what I want to cover as well at the end of the presentation. So let's start with the transmitter section. And... Um, so we basically have a golden box there, and that's a really uh, an actually uh, cut or CAD, CAD drawing out of production. So when we open up this golden box, which has a dimension of five by ten millimeter, and that's really important to 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 to, to remember, we get the golden connector on the left side, which connects this this uh, transmitter, which is also called TOSA. It's a transmitter optical subassembly um, in optical engineering. Uh, it connects the electric connector to the PCB itself of the transceiver where the DSP and the microcontroller is placed and then this PCB again is going to connect to your host, to your switch and router. So first of all we need to place some components in there and the first one is the laser diodes. Uh, as we are talking about 400 gigabit but also applies to a 100 gigabit transceiver, we do have four laser diodes because we are running uh, four lanes there actually and uh, at a speed of 112 gigabit uh, for a 400 gigabit transceiver and so we have four of them and when you do the math you get uh, 400 gigabit. And these laser diodes do have two characteristics, basically. First of all, they consume current, and every component which, which consumes current uh, heats up. And secondly, those laser diodes are pretty much like uh, unfocused light is coming out there. So it's, there is light, it's emitted light, but it's not focused at all. Pretty much like when people are wearing glasses and when they take it off, especially after they, uh, like last night, you don't see anything or you don't see much. Um, so we have to take care about that for the laser diodes and the first thing is we place there a cooler and this cooler also takes current again and this current cools down actually uh, with the characteristic of that cooler, the laser diode. Why is that important? Uh, we want to, to stabilize the, the, the laser diode actually to keep its wavelength because when we let it heat it up to a certain temperature it will drift away from uh, the, the wavelength and that's what we want to avoid. Um, because you can imagine when you when the, the wavelength is going to drift away, uh, you don't the, the link will have a bit errors at the end of the day. So the first goal is to keep the, the wavelength stabilized. The second one is to get the unfocused light focused. You need lenses, and those lenses uh, you have to imagine the X Y Z dimensions. We are talking about 0 0.5 millimeters uh, of such a lens, and during production stage, these lenses are going to be placed. Uh, um, on in 50 nanometer steps uh, in XYZ 
And then when they have the perfect spot, uh, when they're in focus, then they are fixed there. And that's a tricky, tricky process actually, because um, typically it's done with uh, UV hardening glue, which uh, f fixes the, the lenses at this position. But this glue also needs to last for the next years and decades and keeps his, his consistency because uh, when it would change it, the lens would also change its posi position and then we would be out of focus again. So that's a really tricky part and, um, to build it actually uh, and to assemble it. So what we get now is we got a four wavelength focused light, but uh, as you can imagine, these No, this one. Um, these four wavelengths here, they, they won't, they only hit the wall of the golden box, but we want to have them in your, our LC uh, receptacle down there. So how do we achieve that? We add an optical multiplexer and it's a filter block, uh, which makes actually use of pretty uh, simple physics uh, principles with, with an angle. So what happens there is the light is uh, hitting the walls uh, or the angled wall of our filter block and then it's going to be bouncing back and forward, back and forward down to, to that corner here where we all, where we can combine all the four wavelengths and then insert it into our receptacle. That's actually how it's done in a multiplexer um, and it's a really tiny one. Now uh, we are on the line and when we move on the, the four wavelengths are on the line uh, hitting our receiver now and uh, at this stage <coughs> it's again an opened uh, gray box, not a golden anymore but the color doesn't matter here. Um, so actually it works basically the, uh, the other way around so we need a demultiplexer and uh, this demultiplexer also separates all the four wavelengths again for us. Um, same principle here, bouncing back and forward and at the certain uh, filter with which we have here, for example, the green one, it only allows to pass the green, the green light and the other color is going to be bouncing back and forward again uh, down to the, to the yellow filter and only the yellow, li yellow light is allowed to pass that filter. So now we have separated all the four wavelengths again and then, <coughs> sorry, we need to hit again optical lenses to get focused light to a pin diode, which is the counterpart component of our laser diode, which does the conversion from the optical light level to an electrical signal at the end of the day. This electrical signal has a really low amplitude, so we can't use it actually uh, on post-processing systems like on your ASIC or the DSP, they can't handle that signal. So what we do there is we need an amplifi uh, amplifier in that golden box in there. There is one side story if you made, made, have made that experience already when you used a, um, a ZR transceiver, uh, 10, 10 gigabit uh, ZR doing like 80 kilometers. Uh, and when you have connected this transceiver back to back without any attenuation, you might have experienced something like, oh, the link is up. And then after five seconds, the link is down again. And actually, this transceiver is broken then afterwards. Uh, what happened there is, uh, the the, the diet itself, it, 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 is, it is not broken, but what you burned or what you broke a break was the amplifier. The amplifier got too much current in there in the input and it boosted it up way too much and then actually it, took, it, it pulled a lot of current and this current killed actually the amplifier. So you can repair it, just replace the amplifier, open the box and change the amplifier if you want to. So the diet is still alive. Um, you need a Good microscope and uh, maybe, yeah, weekend. Um, when we move on now, so we uh, we have the transmitter section and the receiver section, and I pointed out for that presentation a little bit about the production, uh, which I think is quite interesting to see uh, when it comes to higher speeds, uh, what actually happens during production and what is important to know. And I pointed out the timing. Um, so what you see on that graph here, I have three curves actually and I put it into uh, three sections as well. So on the X axis you see three types of transceivers, 10 gigabit, 100 gigabit and 400 gigabit. On the Y axis, um, that's the timing in minutes. Um, the, the blue line actually describes the assembly time and that's quite obvious uh, when we look down there. Um, the 10 gigabit transceiver takes roughly eight minutes to assemble and to test. The green curve is testing. 
Um, but when we move on, at 100 gigabit, this, this, uh, this gap actually uh, got pretty much uh, wider because the, the testing it has a way steep rise there. Assembly has a, a steady growth actually, so it's a more complex component we were gonna assemble, but the testing is way more complicated and way more time consuming. And especially when we come to 400 gigabit now, uh, still steady growth here, so we're talking about roughly when we build them in batches of 25 minutes to assemble a wall transceiver, but the testing get, got up to roughly 90 minutes and uh, now you can imagine, if you want to cut down costs or want to save money there in production, actually you don't do that on the you don't do that on the assembly because there is not much mar not much much margin in for you. But if you want to do that on the testing, this is a good and a bad thing. If you do it in a good manner, you you uh, automate your processes. That's a good way. Then you get down uh, timing all the time. But you can also just get rid of tests, and then you can also cut down. Uh, the time there, but maybe that's not a good choice. Um, one example for a test could be, let's take the temperature, and there are actually, let's say, two, two different ways to test. One would be, we just cool it down, the transceiver to zero degrees centigrade, measure the optical performance. If, if we are a bit error free, great, check. We're gonna heat it up to 70 degrees. It's fine. Uh, you might see during the, this testing stage that one wavelength is going to drift away a little bit. I sh uh, like this one here, the spectrum of the green wavelength is going to drift away a little bit, but it, at some stage it's going to be normalized again. This would be one test case. But you can also make it more complicated or say, well, we had a second variable there, uh, we had the time. So when we say we cool it down within 30 seconds from room temperature 20 degrees, 20 degrees to zero degrees, keep it there and after 30 seconds again it needs to be stabilized and if it doesn't do it it's going to be f it's a failure part it might stabilize after five minutes but we want to have it stabilized after 30 seconds the same what we're going to do is we heat it up within 60 seconds to to 70 degrees centigrade from coming from zero degrees really to to the hot area um, and also do the same measurement there to see how how long it takes or give give a threshold there until the lasers are going to be stabilized again. And that's a totally different test you do there. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a temperature test, test but either taking the time in, in consideration or not, that this is, a, um, I think, an, an important way to know if you do testing, do it the right way to get a proper result, because otherwise uh, you will end up in failure parts at the end of the day. Uh, another example here is, I made a drawing of an artificial horse driven crane and just to give you a rough idea so uh, when this this horse starts to run and spins the wheel and this gear here will lift up that weight but like it's pretty much like uh, this crane also in a transceiver even the tiniest gear wheel in there if this is going to be break this might crash the gear but it can be even worse uh, some other components might be also influenced by that crash, like here that weight, it will run down and destroy something else. Um, this can also happen at transceiver, so if, if one component fails uh, inside there, it might can crash other components as well and uh, destroy the entire uh, transceiver at the end of the day. So far for the production, um, the overall goal in production is for sure having a uh, do it in a, in, in, a, in a certain amount of time, cut down the timing there for sure, but cover the maximum of test cases and also uh, the proper test cases there. As I mentioned at the beginning in the presentation, I do have a, a second uh, component in there, or actually it's the third one, the DSP, um, uh, and it holds also the function of the forward error correction. Mm. What does the forward error correction do? And actually, we know it already a little bit when we look in uh, 10 gigabit. Uh, we have something like uh, error detection already. When you look at the Ethernet frame, you have at the end, you have a cycling redundancy checksum at the end, um, which is calculated o o over the uh, Ethernet frame. <coughs> and with that checksum, you can actually do detection. Now at 100 gigabit, uh, it's, it's certain applications of 100 gigabit and definitely mandatory for 400 gigabit. Beside detection, we also need correction and we, we need forward error correction to, to correct errors which will happen on the line. 
Um, how will that, how is that basically done? Uh, pretty simple, in 100 gigabit you have a FEC en uh, uh, encoder it, on your switch. It, uh, it adds some overhead that we'll show in the next slide a little bit more. Uh, brings the signal with the payload on the line and on the other side we have the FEC decoder uh, which takes off the overhead and uh, gives the payload actually to the uh, ASIC and then you can do all the Ethernet stuff there. Now, how actually does it work? When you look at that payload, and I took that artificial example here of that tiny lorry, so that lorry actually is our FEC encoder, and inside that lorry we have bricks, and these bricks are in, in a certain order, so we have uh, blue, red, yellow, uh, green, and uh, blue again, and when in the second step our lorry hits the road and all the bricks get somehow disordered and even one brick is lost actually down there. Um, on the third step we have the excavator which is our effect decoder and he, he has the capability to bring all the bricks in order again and even can make, make it happen that the blue brick is back in the payload of the lorry. Um, what you can imagine, this, this process takes a little bit time. Uh, like that excavator, it takes a little bit of time to bring all the bricks back in order in that lorry. Um, the same uh, is um, the same applies for effect. So effect typically, when you do de de detection and correction, it takes you roughly, depending on the implementation of that effect, of 100 nanoseconds of delay. Um, how powerful is such effect uh, in these days? Um, the typically, which is used in Ethernet can correct roughly when we take uh, a, a frame, for example, with 1,500 bytes, which end up in 12,000 bits. Uh, we can correct up to 330 bits actually there when they are not clustered, when the errors occur in that frame and they are not clustered. But when they are clustered at a certain spot, then the performance really get, gets worse and we get down to roughly 33 bits in the worst circumstance to correct these errors there. Um, how will it look like in 400 gigabit? It will be more complicated actually. So we still have uh, the FEC encoder on the switch side, I'll call it here FEC2, and then it's encoded. But then on the transceiver side we also have a FEC. This FEC first of all does a decoding, of, so we, we took care about the, the, the connection between the ASIC and the transceiver itself on the traces on our PCB of the switch. Um, and then it's again encoded in the transceiver, brought onto the line uh, on the fiber, and then on the other side in the transceiver, the FEC decodes it, the, the line signal, encodes it for the host signal actually, and then on the switch side, we do decoding again. Um, this, first of all, at the end of the day, you will have not only uh, two FECs involved, you have at the worst circumstances, uh, four FECs involved, this, this will add an more delay actually to your link uh, and it will consume power. Uh, the FEC inside that transceiver will take roughly two watts just to do the FEC performance to do it. Um, and um, there are actually two scenarios when you when you're in a practical attempt which we also learned in 100 gigabit uh, where you might look uh, to the FEC. By default the FEC should be enabled automatically based on the type of transceiver which is plugged in and in 400 gigabit uh, it also needs to make sure which FEC is going to be enabled, the switch FEC or the transceiver FEC. And um, if, if for example if you don't have, uh, or if, if the switch doesn't enable the FEC at all and you do see bit errors on your link itself, you might going to double check the setting of the FEC. Maybe it happened and we have seen that uh, scenarios that the FEC was not enabled. Um, so it, this is a, a good chance when you enable the FEC manually uh, on both sides and then uh, you get a bit of a link free. And the second scenario could also be uh, you, you can't establish your link at all. Uh, you might gonna check the amount of facts which are gonna be involved because when you have an unequal amount of facts, facts involved like three, it won't work at all. Like here in this is example, the excavator, he can't handle a bobby car. Uh, but he can handle the lorry, but still the bobby car is way too big for it. And so um, you need really to check both sides which fact is enabled and not uh, if, if the link can't establish at all. Yeah, um, brings me almost to the end of the presentation. 
um, what happens new in the market or what is going to be uh, the latest developments there. And I'm pretty proud to actually to announce now that uh, we uh, got the first 400 gigabit link tested and it's already in production since last week. Uh, up to uh, two kilometers, it's working. Um, that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, what will happen on 400 gigabit? Uh, you might remember the presentation last year on DNOC where I also introduced the different standards for um, 400 gigabit. And I also mentioned a little bit about LR4. Uh, LR4 is still not defined completely when it comes to the, the wavelengths which are going to be selected. So there are different forces or people who want to push uh, LR4, so typically 10 kilometer application on single mode fiber to a CWDM4 wavelength grid, which is a spacing of 20 nanometers, which is actually quite new when you compare it with 100 gigabit, because at 100 gigabit LR4, we are used to LAN WDM, which has a spacing of 5 nanometer. And it's still, I just double checked it yesterday, uh, it's still not defined which um, selection will be done if it's either LAN WDM or CWDM4 wavelength uh, grid uh, for the standard, uh, for the LR4 standard, and uh, hopefully there will be soon a solution out there. Or actually, physically, it, it's doable, both solutions. It's, uh, at the end of the day, it's a matter how much it's going to be cost, because the LAN WDM is way more uh, expensive to produce than the CWDM4 wavelength grid. Um, what happened on 100 gig? I, I expected not much happening in, uh, in the last uh, month on 100 gigabit and somehow the, the landmark was 25, 30 kilometers with a single transceiver without amplification getting there. Uh, but suddenly um, ER4, 40 kilometers instead of 4, uh, 80 kilometers straight out of a transceiver without amplification occurred and it's uh, available and also producible. Um, that's pretty cool. So we are actually a little bit back where we are with 10 gigabit can do a dark fiber straight up to 80 kilometers without any amplification, which is pretty nice. And uh, one side story, what I see on the market is a little bit about 50 gig uh, ethernet ER or it can also be an LR solution up to 40 kilometers. Uh, on LR up to 10 kilometers. Um, is, this is more like a looking glass from my side. It, there might be a chance that the 50 gig Ethernet, which is mainly developed or was developed for the 5G mobile operators, uh, connecting their poles to the 5G network, um, that this can have an influence also on the data center side, because when you look or, or on the ISP side, because when you look in, inside a switch, the ASIC, which is built in there, has the capability to run, let's take a 400 gigabit AC, he can do 400 gigabit, but also 200, 100, 50, 40, 25, 10 gigabit. Technically, the, the ASIC is able to handle 50 gig Ethernet. It's more a question is the operating system of the switch can handle it. Uh, and why is it an interesting technology? Because in the 5G world, it's a massive deployment of those components, and the, the prices of 50 gig Ethernet will, or in the transceiver side, it will drop tremendously or, or starting actually in a really low level because um, there are huge amount of uh, components involved uh, to, to get a deployment done. And this might be an interesting solution also in, on an ISP side if when there is not 100 gigabit needed and you need really to look on the costs. But uh, as I said, it depends on the switch operating system or the router operating system if it will support 50 gig Ethernet. Um, and then on the single lambda side, uh, we do see 25 gig DWDM LR4 available and usable and the same for 40 gig uh, DWDM, uh, one wavelength uh, up to 11 dB power budget. Yeah. Microphone drops off. I held it, but I'm, I'm over, well, finished in time. Um, there's not much to add for, from, for, from my side. It leaves us a lot of freedom to, uh, when it comes to the, the, when we look at the 400 gigabit now, uh, beside the microcontroller, which we already know to how to tweak with the Flexbox, there will be a new component, DSP, which also needs firmware upgrades, configuration changes. Uh, that's going to be a new, new world for us as well, and we are looking forward to do it. So let's see what's going to be happening up to next year. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, any questions? I fixed the microphone again. There is a question. Hi, Jean-Pierre from Helotech. Um, I have a question about the, the cooling. Um, do you see it uh, as realistic to have um, those switches with 100 gig in a cabinet at the end of the, the hall to, to a link, for example, um, um, buildings without cooling? Or would those switches always need to be in a, in a, in a climatized room in the future? Where do you see the, the limit for, for the, the temperature before it, it uh, heats yes. too much? Um. Um, well, that's actually more switching or yeah, a, a switch window question actually how they make the design of, of the switch because when you look at the transceiver itself, uh, a 100 gig, 100 gig transceiver has roughly 5 watts of heat dissipation, a 400 gig will be 15, 20 watts, which is actually compared to the overall system not much, but um, um, there, I I, I haven't seen a solution yet where, where you can't do it without active cooling so far. This, yeah. Does this answer the question? <laughs> the 100 gig uh, ER4, are they in the DWDM grid? And when do you think they are available for testing? Um, the ER4s are available. Uh, we, um, yes, they are available, even the setup 4 and um, they are in the 1310 nanometer window, the typical uh, 1310 nanometer starting from 1270 up to 1330 nanometer. Okay. Yep. Okay. For the 400G, um, the forward error correction be done in the switch, in the transceiver, in both, in neither, that sounds pretty um, confusing and error prone. Isn't there any standardization on the way? Um, Yes, there is. I, I don't know, uh, to be honest, I don't know which uh, FEC is involved at, what, uh, at, when, at which stage. What I know so far at 100 gig, there's the definition to say SR4 needs the FEC by default on the switching side. Also CWDM4 needs it, but LR4 doesn't need it. On the 400 gig, LR4 is not standardized yet, so I can't tell you where they will go. Um, um, and I don't know the, f the numbers or uh, the actually setting for SR or uh, DR4, FR4. Um, let's see very, very will go, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. All right. <laughs>